Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. Before we get into it with our guest here today, I'd like to remind everyone, if you enjoy this content, to please give a like and subscribe down below. I'd greatly appreciate it. We have Colby on the podcast. She's coming to us from Ontario. We have another Canadian on the podcast. And yeah, she's a lifestyle and competition prep coach, and she's competed. And yeah, we're just going to talk about her life's journey and what inspired and motivated her and just discuss all things health and fitness like we do with everyone. But most importantly, she's our current guest. Colby, thank you so much for coming on. No problem. Happy to be here. Well, I mentioned this before. We're going to take the weather out of the equation here. We're not going to, you know, depress ourselves with that. So to get things started, why don't you just give us your backstory on what inspired and motivated you to get in shape and how that led to where you're at right now? So I think a big part of it was that my parents were always in the gym. So I had that positive influence growing up. And I think that makes a huge difference. Um, And then my dad actually competed. I think this was back in like 2004. And women's bodybuilding was not very popular at the time. So that might have sparked something in me. And then I also had a family friend, a woman who did compete. And then I kind of got interested in it around the time that like the bikini category came to be. Um, And then I just saw that on Instagram, I think. And yeah, the rest was history. I didn't like being skinny. So that was why I started lifting back when I was like 15 years old with like dumbbells in my bedroom. And we all, we all get started, you know, basically somewhat something similar to that, but what is probably the biggest thing that you learned when you first got started that you wish you had known about before you took the journey? Because there's so many myths and misconceptions out there about the sport that a lot of people just don't know really anything about it and they don't take the time to really learn it. But I mean, for me, I learned so much just even through my first conversation with someone, but what's one thing that you wish that you had known before you decided to take that step? Uh, I wish, I guess I knew how like horrible you feel like, cause everyone glorifies it, right? Everything you see is like, oh, it's the epitome of health. But then once you get like close to stage leanness, you realize like your body's on the brink of like not surviving. Cause that's what it takes. Like it's muscular anorexia. So yeah, I wish somebody told me that part. I appreciate you being honest about that because a lot of people try to beat around that issue and they don't, you know, mention that when that really is the case, you know, as well, especially those last few weeks in prep. And how long into when you first really got into it before you decided to compete? Do you take a year? Or was it soon? Because a lot of people differentiate on that. And I can normally tell how long they've lasted based on that first answer. Right. So I was lifting for years prior to competing. Uh, probably five plus years um, and which that's probably why I went into my first show and I won the overall because yeah I think a lot of people like to start after like one year in and it's just it's not enough muscle maturity no I totally agree there's so many times that I've talked to people where it's like and it's sometimes even been less than that I've talked to people where it's like three months into working out and I'm like Dear God, they don't even learn posing. They don't even do anything like that. They just show up and they assume that that's going to be. And first of all, I always tell them, do you have any recordings of it? Because I need to watch a comedy tonight. But, you know, it's normally not the case. But just getting started working out, too. I love to talk genetics because everyone's body is built differently. I mean, I could train just like someone else and I could do their supplements. I could, you know, follow their everything to a T and I will not end up looking just like them. But everyone always has that one body part that really takes off that they don't have to train as much. And then everyone has that one body part that just drags behind it. They have to train to oblivion. What's one body part that really took off for you that you didn't really have to worry about? And what's been one body part that you just had to drag behind this entire journey? So my biceps have always been amazing. Great muscle bellies. Um, So, and I probably doesn't. All right, let's get this over with. Let's see the guns then. Jeez. Guns? Yeah. The the creepy bicep fetish guys on yeah here. yeah exactly exactly yeah we got to give them their one second so yeah you got that everyone now so pff, don't even get me started on that colby that's a whole that's a whole tangent where we're gonna oh my god i got into it with them a couple days ago yeah because if you're recording this yeah it's a it's a few days afterwards so oh my god but anyways so yeah your biceps really so you're a gym bro at heart really and then what's with the one body part that really dragged behind right well i probably went years without even training my legs at all because I just didn't like having skinny arms. So that was what I focused on. Um, So, but then my legs did catch up. Um, Honestly, my glutes ended up being too big at one point. So I had to shrink those. But I feel like my whole, like, I don't know, if we're talking genetics, I can't build my lats out. So my lat insertions are just too high up. And I'm never going to like have that width. 
Um, so that kind of sucks. And then I think my hamstrings lack a bit too. Just probably my whole posterior, just genetically. I'm gonna do just do pull ups constantly. But I know some people just genetically just aren't built to have some things happen. Trust me, you're talking yep. to a guy, you're talking to a guy that's six three and my legs. I mean, I could inject pure muscle in them, and they're not gonna you know gain an ounce. So. Yep. But I will say you are one of the first people that actually struggled with glutes early on and then was told that you had to not not train them as much. So, okay, that's a good problem to have, everyone. So I guess, you know, more power to you. And I mean, being in that you've been in the sport for quite a while, what have been some of the biggest changes that you've seen? Because even in the five and a half years that I've been doing these interviews in the podcast, just the sport has become completely night and day. But what's that been like for you as someone who's been, you know, more into it than me seeing all these changes happening? Uh, The changes were pretty drastic from the time I started, and I competed only for like a span of five years. Um, But when I started, the look that they were going for was a lot different, and I pretty much perfectly matched that, and then it was like the next year things started to switch. So yeah, it, it was hard because I was trying to fit the mold of like what it was, Um, and like my legs were too big, for example. So then I was making sure not to put on any more mass there, but then it actually was better to have more. And so. What is that like just dealing with that mentally where you're just constantly comparing your body and you're constantly having to deal with, you know, some people might want a little bit less legs. Some people might want more legs. Some people might want you to be a little bit more toned. Some people might want you to be a little bit more full. What is that like just mentally having to deal with that? Because that was enough to drive me crazy and I'd never even competed. I think for me, I just really don't care. Um, I don't have any like emotional attachment, if you will, to my body. So I kind of just look at it as like if you were building a sculpture. So there is no like real mental aspect for me. Um, I know that's unusual, but yeah, I really don't compare to anything. And when it comes to training, I go for the look that I like, even if that's never going to fit the mold, you know, it's not that important to me. If I'm going to lose because of that, then so be it. At least I'm like confident in my own life and how I want to look right. Well, yeah, good for you. I mean, there needs to be more people that have that instead of just waiting on what the judges say and just, you know, trying to change everything up like that. Cause I mean, that's like 95% of the people that I talk to, you're one of the probably dozen guests that I've had on that actually just says, you know, I do it for me and I don't really look at my body as like that because yeah, the, the unhealthy obsession that this sport can bring with, you know, all that stuff that just leads into a big downfall. But what was your friends and family's reaction? Like when you know something like, Hey, I want to start competing. And has it changed over time? Um, definitely. Like, of course my dad thought it was awesome. So he's in it too. And probably was the initial inspiration there. Um, but I think after years of doing it and like my close family having to deal with the kind of person that it makes me like near the end of a prep, because I will admit, like, I am not great to be around. Um, like I lose my personality. I just get really grumpy and hangry, if you will. Um, and so I think after several years of experiencing that, <laughs> most of them are pretty done with it. <laughs> and I don't blame them. Oh my God. Yeah. It's the family members and the, you know, either the spouses or anyone else in the family, like they deserve medals and monuments for dealing with the stuff that they go into. And that's why I love talking to bodybuilders on the podcast because this is just stuff that most people don't understand that happens behind the behind the working out and behind the going on stage there's just so much more that happens behind that but how has your mental strength changed since you first got started because people always like talk about the physical transformations and unfortunately that's going to be one of the few things that people actually see because they don't obviously they can't get into your mind and just realize the how much mental has changed but what has that been like for you and because with all the physical changes that happen the mental change is you know a hundred times more important and more impactful but what has this whole journey been like for you mentally Mentally, um, it's been good. I think it helped me develop hugely. Um, Before I got into competing, if I could use this as an example, like I would not have been on this podcast right now because that's how like much I've struggled socially my whole life. So just since getting into all of it and becoming a coach, I guess all of it kind of sort of stems from competing um, initially and then 
yeah, just all of it has helped me to grow so much. And then obviously just you learn what you're capable of as far as time management, um, like back when, you know, people say they have no time and then you do find time for the gym and then it's like you have a new job and you can still find time. You have a kid and you can still find time. So, you know, as you age and you just get more piled on your plate and learn that you are still able to make time, like stuff like that changes you. Um, and then, yeah, just the, the dedication to something like a type of dedication that you can't even understand if, unless you've been through it. Like, yeah, all that stuff just helps you to grow and build so much confidence that, yeah, it just carries over to all areas of your life. How long into your journey before you decide like, hey, I could help out others and become, you know, a lifestyle prep coach? So I was one of those people that like they uh, talk down about on social media that like competes once and decides they're going to be a coach. Um, and I have no shame. Because oh, God, not one of these people. Jesus. No, I'm kidding. I, I know. But yeah, that's the way I did it. Um, I didn't have like a formal education of any sort and I could go into all of that and why but I won't unless you want me to um <laughs> but yeah yeah it's your so I mean yeah if you don't want to talk about it you don't have to talk about it this is you know I'm not holding anyone at gunpoint here but yeah it's just it's just fascinating how some people you know just from talking to you, I can already tell you're one of the exceptions where normally the people I talk to that do the thing where they're the, like, they do the one show and they just do that. You're like, okay, what's going on here? But some people like, especially with your background where you had a dad that competed too as well. So at least you, you weren't just one of those people that literally just did it for clout. And then was just like, oh. oh, hey, watch me compete and stuff, which trust me, I've talked to some of those people and I'm just like, okay, we only have 20 minutes left in this podcast. So just pull through Ryan. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, I had a passion for it for so many years already before this point where I decided to coach and I had so much education that I just learned on my own. Um, and I just have the mindset of turn your passion into a paycheck. So that's what I did. Absolutely. Hey, trust me, if I could do that with this, I totally would, but we're not there at the point yet, but just being that you look the way that you look. I mean, I always compare it to sort of being like a mini celebrity, especially if you walk out in public where people just, when they see something that's not the normal, it's human nature to just kind of pay more attention to it. What's that been like? And has it gotten easier for you as you've, you know, done this lifestyle more and more to sort of accept that you might get some stares? Or is it still where you're just like, okay, this is kind of weird? I honestly haven't noticed much of that. But I mean, I'm also not like a great big bodybuilder. I'm sure my answer would be very different. Like, I think even maybe when I'm stage lean, I'll get a few looks and comments. And people probably just think I have an eating disorder at that point, to be honest. I get really self conscious of that like I don't like going into stores and stuff in like shorts and a sports bra and I would end up in that position a lot and I just feel like the people around me are probably like you know she's not okay because that's how I start to look when I get lean so that I don't like but it's it's mostly been positive if anything like random people come up to me in the gym and just tell me how awesome I look and like that's nice but then there's also the flip side where like when you put some weight on nobody is saying nice things to you anymore. So then you really notice that side of it as well. But again, it's just having a good head on your shoulders. You have to be prepared for all these things and the the different ways people are going to act and not let anything like bother you. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree with that. And just realizing that this is a sport that, you know, takes so much time and dedication out of it. And, you're always going to have those days where you just don't feel like it. Everyone has that. And I've had some people deny it and I just nod my head and say, yeah, okay. They're telling the truth, even though I know deep down they aren't. But when you have those days personally, where do you think that strength comes from to still push through and, you know, get the workouts done? Because a lot of people in the general public, that's the reason why they could never do that. And I'm one of them too, where if you have that day where you're just not feeling it at all, I would find a way to not do it. But just with bodybuilding, where do you think that that inner strength comes from for you that is able to get you to overcome a lot of that stuff? I could give you like a really surface level bogus answer, or I could tell you what I think the honest truth is. And I think, honest truth. I think that working out for me is like my autistic obsession. So I have stayed so consistent and a go 90% of the days I don't want to and stuff because I have to. It's not a choice in my mind. So. 
Yeah. No, that's more power to you. I mean, I wish I, uh, I mean, you're not shooting heroin or anything like that. So, I mean, hey, more power to you with that. It's a healthy obsession. But yeah, I, I've been at that point in my life too, especially when I was younger in my early 20s that I had times too where like, yeah, you have to go to the gym regardless. And I've, you know, been deadly sick and working out at home. I don't go to a public gym if I'm ever deadly sick because God forbid, I don't want to be one of those guys. But yeah, yeah I mean, I, I totally understand that. And being that, you know, I take it that you, at some points have been on the rather shy side. How did you convince yourself to go and step on stage in a bikini in front of people? That has never been easy for me. And that doesn't get easier for me each time either. Um, I like, I'm very competitive. I wanted to have some kind of a reward to show for all the hard work that I put in that I'm going to be putting in, whether or not I'm getting on stage. Like I might as well try to achieve something from it. Um, so that was my mindset there, I guess. What is that moment like, though, when you finally get to step up on that stage and show off all that hard work that you've worked months upon months on? Mortifying. Like, for me, there is no joy in that. I hate every second of it. I pretty much black out. Um, but when they call your name when you won, like, that's that's a really cool experience. At that point, it kind of calms the nerves and it's just really exciting so yeah all of that for a good like you know few seconds well again i really do appreciate her honesty because so many people would lie and say like oh my god it's a great feeling when deep down they a lot of them are mortified as well and you know i would be in that field myself but you also have a son too and how have your time management skills evolved as you've done this lifestyle because like we've mentioned before you need to be like a certain type a person a lot of times because i have yet to meet a type b that does this but how are you able to organize all this stuff? Because just having all the stuff that you have on your plate, it scares me even. Well, when it comes to having a kid, I had a very supportive partner at that time. So he would get home from work and that's when I was able to go to the gym. Um, I had to utilize my nap times really well to get my meal prep done. And yeah, I would just do what I could. And then if there were days I couldn't make it to the gym, like, that happened um or with having a kid too like here's something to consider my days would like start at 5 a.m and go till 11 p.m and when you're low in calories there were days that i had to eat things i wasn't supposed to because like just to survive like i was out taking my kid like on excursions and he's walking around and i'm feeling like there's a chance that i could just pass out right now and you know he's just gonna run into the road so like there's risk with it too it's a lot Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's so much more to it that, especially when you add a kid to it yet too, it just makes things so much more difficult. And it, you know, it's just impressive that you're able to do all that because I look at like those three things, like your job, even though your job does involve the gym, still a job, you know, being a bodybuilder and being a mom, like two of those three things are enough to make me almost have a heart attack. So I can't, you know, imagine doing all three. You manage. Yeah. You just find do. It. have two more kids. You still manage. Oh um, yeah, I've talked to someone with eight kids, and I'm just like, okay, at, at that point, just ha- the, the oldest one can just watch all the rest of them. Come on, I mean, like, let, let's be completely honest here. But just being that you are, you know, a coach as well, what would you say is probably one of the biggest mistakes that people make when they first get into the sport of bodybuilding? Ooh, I'm gonna have to think about that one. Um, when it comes to the sport itself, like actually getting on stage. I would say that people just don't take enough time to properly build or to necessarily know how to properly build. So I think it's important to have a coach. This is something that if, if I could change in the first place, I would have liked to, but having a knowledgeable coach um, in the category that you're trying to do so that they can build you properly to fit that, that category. um, I think that's really important. I was going to say, I've only had two guests on that have never had a coach in their life and they've been successful in the sport. So it's a very rare commodity and it takes a special type of person to do that. And they are not many out there. So I will say getting that coach, but we got to talk about the P word now posing. I would have never guessed in a million years that for so many people, that's the hardest thing about this sport. But what has your relationship been like with posing? Posing doesn't come naturally to me. Um, Wearing heels does not come naturally to me. I kind of walk like a dude in everyday life. So, you know, it's kind of like if you put a pair of heels on. Um, But 
and again, this is an area where it would be nice to have a coach. And I'm someone who's never had a coach for anything. I did for a very short time. Once we kind of just collaborated and worked together on my body because I knew my body so well too. Um, but yeah, I could definitely benefit from like real professional help in the posing department, but I've gotten by, I've self-taught pretty well. Um, just comes down to, I think, uh, the shyness factor again for me when it comes to actually posing on stage like I can't pose like I'm confident and you know sexy kind of a thing because like that's not my inner monologue and I was gonna say you picked a hell of a division to do that in because in bikini like you have to have your own flair and pizzazz and it's your own separate type of personality and a lot of people aren't born with that and it's very hard to learn if you don't really naturally have that so yeah it's just oh. it's fast the moment that i you know, got the general idea that like, Oh, you're a little bit more on the shy side. I was like, how the heck is she doing bikini then? But Hey, some people just find, you know, a, a way to adapt and just oh, you know what it is for me. I can, ha I have a better answer than that. I drink alcohol before I get on stage. Thank you for saying that because so much. So when I first got started, like five people said that for me and then everyone else has denied it since. And I know deep down that Quite a few people do. Now, I'm not going to say it's the majority, but I do know that there are people that do. And every once in a while, like, and I never ask them when we're recording because I was like, eh, it doesn't matter. But like, right after we're done recording, I used sometimes ask guests, like, you know, like two or three questions just for my own, you know, curiosity. And one of them's like, hey, do you ever like take a shot before you go on stage? And 99% of people would say no. But I do know that, like, I've been backstage at one show and I was doing like backstage access and it was like half of everyone was like doing just one quick shot before they step on stage. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, like I have to. I, I, yeah, I should mention that because I could not get on stage without it. I tried once at like a night show to see how I would be, and like I couldn't even smile because the nerves were that bad for me. So, yeah, it absolutely takes me liquid courage to be able to get up there at all. And then, it, like, getting on that stage almost just like brings me back to like a normal, confident person level, like, sobers me up like immediately, but still able to like go through the motions you should have done a shot before the interview then we'd see how that really how that really goes with that no but it's no uh, yeah it's 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 just fascinating how some people do things to get it and i if i was still playing baseball when i was of the legal age to drink i can guarantee if, if it was a really big game i might just do one shot before i walked down there and mound just to loosen myself up obviously i wouldn't okay. be drunk but it would just be just to yep. not be so uptight because i have that i had that anxiety her, right what just to be the person you wish you were yeah yeah absolutely yeah and the, yeah could you imagine me if i did it if i did this podcast any bit inebriated it would be i mean it would go viral but it might not go viral for the right reasons too where i would just be just a mess it would just be it would be bad so that that's you know that's you know a more, a more positive thing that doesn't happen but gotta talk about the c word too as well that i hate more than life itself it's cardio and when it comes to cardio i mean i can go for walks which are totally fine with me but when you become a bodybuilder, unfortunately, you sign a deal with the devil when it comes to cardio. What is your relationship like with cardio? Well, lucky for me, I don't have to do a whole lot of cardio. Um, so I have one of those nice body types where it takes me 10 years to build the muscle that most people could build in like six months. So there's a perk to it, though, right? Um, but yeah, I don't do a lot of cardio, not till like near the end of a prep. Um, wait what so there are points in a prep where you don't even do cardio oh yeah i probably don't do it till the last like four or five weeks maybe and then i just start like adding in little bits like you know 10 minutes a day um yeah jesus and if i had to do a ton of cardio to get on stage i would not get on stage to be completely honest with you because i i have talked to people that have had to do two and a half hours a day for like a, had, like months yeah yeah. No carbs, two hours of cardio a day. I eat junk food all through my prep. And what? Uh, yeah. I track it. I stay within a certain calorie range, but I don't, you know, try to eat clean whole foods. How is that even? Po Jeez Louise. So you I, a lot of people eat, do it that way. I, I know. But again, like you're being one of the only like kind of somewhat truthful people on here so it is shocking for me to finally hear someone like spill the beans like that because a lot of people try to just have that image of like i never made a mistake in my life i'm squeaky clean with I all that stuff and yeah to give you honesty 
about everything. God, let's have her on every single day. Jeez, Louise, this is awesome. So, I mean, yeah. So, what's your go-to junk food to eat during a prep? I'm into dessert foods. So, like, cakey things. Um, during prep, obviously, like, I can't fit that much in. So, I might have, like, Timbits frozen in my freezer. Do you know what those are? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, I do, yeah. There's... I'm sorry. I just can't. I'm just still processing my head around this whole thing because and everyone, I do got to elaborate that she isn't like she mentioned before, like you're not just stuffing your face filled with junk food. Like it's all tracked and it's all like properly proportioned. I st- feel like I got to get it out there. Cause I don't want people to be like, wait, she's able to do that. I'm going to like have two pumpkin pies then every day before I go and work out. And so it's like, no, it's not gonna, it's not gonna end up like that. So when it comes to your training as well, a lot of people do different training methods a lot. I mean, time on attention is a big one. A lot of other things. What training style do you really prefer? I just do normal reps, a hypertrophy training program. Um, I focus on frequency. So I hit my muscle groups two to three times a week. Um, yeah, I, I train weird too. I don't go in and like, you know, do a warm up set of something. It's like I start as heavy as I can for my very first set. I go to failure and. And I, I lighten the weight as I go if I have to. So I think that's like kind of backwards to what a lot of people do. They like start lighter and increase. I don't know. That doesn't make sense to me. But. Well, no, you do burnout sets, which is something that I still do every once in a while now too. Where like, especially like if I'm curling, I'll start at like, you know, like 80 or 90 pounds. And then you'll, you'll do 10 reps and then you'll do 10 less pounds and you'll do 10 reps and then you'll do it like back to back to back. And God, it's one of the best burns you'll ever feel. But the gym bro on me, when you said that like your arms were the thing that really, really took off. Obviously, being a comp- bikini competitor, that doesn't really benefit you that much. So how hard is it for the body part that really takes off for you isn't really that beneficiary to what you're able to do? Because for me, like, if I had to ever not train my arms as much, I don't I don't know what I would do. Well, I feel like it's, like, I don't even have time to train my arms. When I'm, like, in competition prep, it's like there's just, there's too many muscles that I need need to hit so many times a week already that, like, I can't imagine actually having more to fit in there. I already have to like, I'll usually let my back suffer so that my shoulders can be trained more frequently. And I don't want to spend two and a half hours in the gym. I just don't. I mean, people don't understand how minuscule this sport is when it comes to just some people are training like one tiny part of their back, which is just so many muscles. They're just trying to find that one thing that really just gets that one tiny area to pop because it's all about the aesthetic look for, you know, the judges. So it's just, it's that to me is the one thing that shocked me the most is just how scientific a lot of these competitors are, especially with their, you know, their look and their aesthetic, but we're just past the new year. I mean, we're already in February now, but New Year's Eve resolutioners, I normally hate them, but they are trying to better themselves, so everyone kind of lay off them a little bit, even though they are taking up way too much space. But if someone were to walk up to you and say, you know, Colby, I made a decision, I just want to get in shape. What's the best piece of advice that you give them? And I know everyone else is different, but I mean, it's like a general thing that a lot of people could, you know, just be like, oh, hey, I'm just looking for something to get me started. Hire a coach. Like, it will save you so much time and energy trying to learn it on your own like I so regret not hiring a coach sooner just for learning things like nutrition and stuff like just things that I didn't know and yeah could have saved a lot of like questioning am I doing this right um yeah just by getting you know a coach for a short time that too and everyone don't go full on Rambo when you go to the gym don't just you know I know some people that they go and they work out three hours a day for like three days and then they just burn their entire body out where then they're just like yeah you because you overtrained to start and you just your body's just not gonna recover as well for that but if someone were to also walk up to you and say you know we made the decision you can change one thing about the sport of bodybuilding as well and everything would be changed like you had, if i gave you the god power to change one thing about bodybuilding it can even be more than one if you have one what would be one thing you like to see changed Ooh. okay we're gonna have to cut again this trust me for guests that I don't even normally cut for. This is the one question that like, yeah, like 25% of the time I do have to cut. So it's not a big deal. Uh, Cause I don't know. I never really thought about it. Um, I think it would be cool if they had like 
say like a body fat percentage requirement rather than just a specific look and like if the bikini category could be have a higher body fat so that it could actually be a category of health like you could be healthy and still be competitive in it which obviously it makes sense why that doesn't work out but um yeah no I, I, I get what you're saying with that yeah I also wish that they would actually drug test in the natural federations and stuff. Oh, she said natural federations. I was going to tell her, I was like, no, they shouldn't in the NPC because everyone would fail. And then no, they'd have, they'd have nobody on stage when they called for everyone to do it. But no, it's in the NPC, but in the, in the natural stream of it. Yeah, no, absolutely. That should. Cause you pay for it too. Yeah. That's the thing too. It's just, and the, and the money thing too, where it's like, if you're a pro, you should just be given like a stipend or something like that because like people, a lot of people foolishly, I will say now go into this thinking that like, Oh yeah, I can make some money and stuff like that. It's like, no, no, you're not. Unless you win the Olympia, you're not going to make any money. And so if we can spread that, if there's one message that I could spread about the sport, that's the one that I would, you know, definitely do myself because yeah, it's just, it's, it's not going to happen. And it's, I love when I get asked if I make money in this, I'm like, no, but like I spend a whole lot to do it. Oh yeah. <laughs> And that's another thing that makes me you know, so impressed with these guests because you guys put yourself through so much and then you end up being in the red in money. So oh, yeah. it's like you have to just. It's oh, yeah, you have to be you have to be a little bit of a psychopath. And, you know, there's a good psychopath and there's a bad psychopath. You're not. Yeah, exactly. And again, I was there too myself and I still I still have other tendencies too, where like I get all in, especially like doing podcasts where some days I'll just be doing this almost all day and it's my one day off work. So yeah, I trust me. I understand a little, I understand to an extent, you know, the little bit, you know, just how your mind works and how you just, yeah, yeah it just, it just works its way around. Yeah. 100%. And just with all the stuff that you do and all the examples also that you're setting your son as well. How important is it for you too, just to be that example for him that like, yeah, you can be in shape and you can really be healthy and fit because studies have proven, you know, the more healthy the parents are, the vastly more, uh, the vastly more amount of a chance that the kid's going to end up healthy as well. I think with me being able to see like what it's done for me in my own life and thinking he has some of the similar issues to what I do just knowing how much confidence it can build for you, like even just to look good on its own, like dedication and stuff aside, like does crazy things for your confidence. So yeah, I absolutely would hope that he would follow suit in that way, or at least get into something, be dedicated to something, you know? Well, and I know that you're going to be completely honest with this because you have been so far, but if you were to go back and look or and even like show the old version of yourself before you started competing, a photo of you in a bikini on the stage, what would your old version of yourself say? And what would their reaction be like to seeing that that's what they would end up achieving? Oh, they would probably be absolutely ecstatic, which is unfortunate because like me now can't think that way. It's like we just, you know, body dysmorphia. We're never going to be good enough, right? You're always going for the next level, but that's what bodybuilding is. Like very rarely do you get someone that's like, oh, I made it. Like I'm there. I'm just going to maintain now. Again, a handful of them, and they are, you know, an incredibly yeah. rare breed. But also with social media, I mean, in Instagram in general, it's a great platform. I get all my guests on it, and it's I wouldn't be able to do this podcast without it. But on the negative side too, as well, people take photos at certain angles. They do other things too to make themselves, you know, look better. A lot of times, I always think that if I had ever even mentally been able to step on stage, I would be the guy that I'd be scrolling through and. You know, if I knew what guests would be on the stage, I'd find their Instagram page and I'd just be like stalking them almost a little bit. Okay. Have you struggled with that? And if you have, how do you try to not do that as much? Because again, I would be that person that does it 100%. So I did that really bad my first show. And what I learned from that experience was that, you know, I found so many girls that I were like, oh, she's going to beat me like 100%. And then half of them ended up being, um, in a different division. So they were like figure girls I was looking at and like, oh, they look way better than me. Well, no shit. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, I think bigger is better. And anyway, so then that was silly. And then there were girls that were in my division that I thought were going to beat me for sure. And they end up having more flaws than you were 
able to see on social media, right? Because as you said, everything's taken in, you know, the right lighting and the right angles. So I, I learned from that experience that it's silly to even look and try to draw your own conclusions like that. And like, why would you want to discourage yourself before you even get there for no reason? Because I went on, you know, at that show, like I said, I went on to win and thought, well, like that was all really silly and a waste of time and energy, right? And when it comes to being a coach, what is your favorite thing about being a coach? And what is your least favorite thing about being a coach? I love the heartfelt messages that I get from girls that I've helped and or just how happy they are to have found me like that right there is the whole reason that I do what I do. Um, what I hate is when people don't give you the honest truth when they check in um, because it doesn't benefit anyone. And then it makes me unable to help them and also makes me feel like I have no idea what I'm doing here. Like, why is this person not seeing progress? And then like almost always I find out down the line from this person, you know, they'll come back and be like, oh yeah, this is why I actually wasn't uh, seeing progress. Great. So I wish people would just be honest, I guess is the thing. If I had a dime for every time I heard people that like, yeah, they don't, they don't follow the program, but then they're shocked that they don't get the results. And they're like, I did everything right. And it's like, well, if we go through and actually like, look at it, you'll see plenty of times where you could have done stuff better, but you didn't. So yeah, that would be a pain too. I think really, if I, you know, delved into it as well, but what are your plans for this year? When we had, I'd love to have you on in a year just to give us an update on what you've been up to. Where would you like to be at a year from today? What are some of your goals? We're talking fitness. We're talking fitness, life in general. Yeah. Just overall, what are some of your goals? My goal right now is to be happy. Um, so competing isn't falling into that because that just wrecks me and everyone around me. Um, so yeah, I'm just focusing on doing other things, um, trying to build as far as fitness goes. I guess that's always been the mission for me. So, you know, taking time away from dieting, probably do some photo shoots. Um, but yeah, really just living, trying to survive. I don't have a whole lot of plans, but it's going to be a good year. All right. And everyone, I just got to warn everyone ahead of time. This is not me hitting on the guest, but I did make a post about her saying that like, she's like a Victoria's secret model that works out. How are you not a model already? Because like you have that look. And when I first saw your page, I was like, okay, yeah, she's definitely a model. Like it's not, it's not even me complimenting you. It's just me saying a basic fact. Like, how are you not doing that right now? Well, thank you. But uh, I guess just nobody's discovered me yet. <laughs> Send them my way. Send them your way. Yeah, I get, I mean, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. You definitely have that look where I was, I was shocked when I learned that you weren't. And I was like, okay, what, what's going on here? So I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. And just in general, you know, with everything that goes on in the sport and all the stuff that happens and when people, you know, ask me why I do this, I always respond, you know, I love sharing people's stories and I love, you know, helping spread their helping spread, you know, their journeys. When people ask you, why do you compete? What's the answer that you like to give them? Because it's an honest question that I think a lot of people think when they hear about all the struggles that competitors go through, they just think to themselves, why do these people put themselves through this? For me, again, it's just the competitive nature of it. Um, I love sports. So I want to be good at something, um, be able to win at something. Winning is fun for me. Um, so I guess it's just something that I'm good at that just has so many benefits that, you know, for everyday life as well. Like I want to look good regardless. So it just makes sense to do it, I guess. Yeah. Absolutely. It's just, it's a positive thing to have. And it, you know, there's, you know, there's negatives, to everything too, as well, but you just got to outweigh the negatives and the positives and definitely falls into it for, you know, this life as well. And all right, before we wrap things up, anyone that you'd like to give a shout out to, I was going to say, I, I, I didn't even, I didn't even know if I should even ask that question in the first place, but I had to, I was like, yeah, let's just make this podcast like 15 seconds longer. Then. How so can I, I, how can I trigger her autism one last time? Oh, apps. We... Wait. So are you, are you like actually on the spectrum? I don't have a formal diagnosis. Okay. I love to get one just to have the label for my own self and yeah. have to answer the like why I am the way I am, but yeah. I probably will never spend the money to do that. 
because yeah, yeah, like you sent me a message like, oh, I, I don't know if my autism would be funny again. And I was like, oh, so she actually had, and then you mentioned like you're on the spectrum. So that's that's why I asked everyone. I wasn't just saying like, oh, she sounds really autistic here, so I'm gonna try to figure it. Again, dealing with the idiots that I deal with, Colby, you have to be so specific about things because they have the IQ of a five year old. So and mom. being that you are mom, yeah, you know, so I- yeah, yeah, exactly. So you know what it's like to deal with that. So you have to be. Everything has to be laid out, and you can't really do anything like that. So, again, every, yeah, so that's, yeah, all right. But, yeah, and again, Colby, we cannot thank you enough for coming on and sharing your journey with us. It was an absolute delight, and, again, my pleasure to have you on. Absolutely. I'd love to come back sometime. Absolutely. Well, everyone, this is Ryan Johnson, DD on the spot. Go check out our Instagram page. I'll warn you ahead of time. Bye, everywhere. It will inspire you to get off that couch and stop eating all those Twinkies. But, again, this is Ryan Johnson, DD on the spot, signing off. Have a great day, everyone.